sitting up here acting like Satan's sidekick in here talking about you ruined your own life. I didn't have nothing about it. Nobody told you to stay. What's going on? Cause see, I'm not gonna let you go back too far from center. I just moved into my place and <laughs> within that week time, like me and Mr. Richardson basically gave our house a blessing or well, my house a blessing. <laughs> 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 and, and we had 31 yeah, days of sex unprotected and... Did I hear you say you had 31 days straight of yes. unprotected yes. sex? <laughs> the scene starts with the courtroom buzzing like it's some sort of legal drama series premiere. The court session begins, announced as Walker v. Sir DeVost. The judge, Jerome, and the audience exchange greetings as if they're old pals at a reunion, setting a courtroom vibe that's strangely warm yet serious. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is a case of Walker v. DeVost. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Mr. Walker, you claim the defendant led you to believe fathered her son, Kamani, for an entire year, but just six months ago told you you are not father and refuses to let you see him. Miss DeVos admits with a poker face that could win championships that, yes, she let Mr. Walker sign the birth certificate and led him to believe he was Kaimani's dad. But now, plot twist, she's adamant he's definitely not the biological father. The stage is set for a courtroom drama that's better than daytime TV. Miss DeVos, you admit you allowed Mr. Walker to sign the birth certificate and led him to believe he is Kamani's father, but now you say he definitely is not his biological father. Ms. DeVos, he hasn't seen your son in six months? Yes. Tell me about that. Ms. DeVos explains why Mr. Walker hasn't seen Kaimani in six months. It's simply because in her book, he isn't the dad. She regrets letting him sign the birth certificate, kind of like how one might regret a questionable late-night Amazon purchase. She's here today to set the record straight and maybe get a return on that mistaken paternal acknowledgement. The reason why you haven't seen my son in six months is because he is not the father. That simple. Yeah. I regret letting him sign the birth certificate. I just feel, I, I, I feel bad because I let him do it. But I just wanted to get the truth out today and just, fi just figure out he's not the father so I can get him off the birth certificate. Mr. Walker is absolutely certain Kaimani is his son, defending his case like a lion would his cub. He recounts his involvement during the pregnancy and the birth with the passion of a telenovela hero. His unwavering commitment stands in stark contrast to Miss DeVost's shifting stories and the messy complications of their past relationship. But Mr. Walker, you are certain this is your biological child? Yes, Your Honor, this is my son right here. And so you had a relationship with him before? Yes. And then for the past six months, you have not seen him? I haven't been allowed to see my son the last six months because claims that I am not the father. But you're on the birth certificate. Yes, Your Honor. I was there the whole time, the whole pregnancy and there at the hospital. And so you were here the day he entered this world. Yes. Here comes the backstory that feels straight out of a sitcom. Mr. Walker and Miss DeVost first met in foster care, lost touch, and then reconnected like a classic will they, won't they plotline. They hung out a lot, not exactly an item, but more than friends, creating the perfect storm for a paternity predicament. We met when we was in foster care. We was like this group home setting for older youth uh, to live on their own independently. We met there, we became friends. When I went away to school, we had lost touch with whatever, and then I came back, we had, I don't know, somehow we got back in contact. We wasn't in a relationship, but a situation like we was together. So it wasn't a committed relationship, but you spent a lot of time. Yeah. And you were intimate. Yes. Miss DeVos throws another curveball, revealing that around the time Kaimani was conceived, she was also seeing another guy. Yep, it's one of those daytime soap opera twists. This bombshell complicates the paternity question even further and makes you wonder if there's a Maury Povich cameo coming up. I was with him, someone else. So that's why we're here. So you admit you you were also intimate with another person during the window of consent. Yes, Your Honor. And that's the person you believe is Kamani's biological father. Yes, Your Honor. So, Mr. Walker, take me to the point when you find out she's pregnant. What do you do? When I find out that she's pregnant, I really just start to prepare myself mentally. I was really trying to just prepare myself for everything. So I know what it means to have a child. I didn't really have a dad growing up. I grew up in the system, and I don't know. I like babies. The plot thickens, and the courtroom is eating it up. Mr. Walker shares how doubts about Kai Manny's paternity first crept in after Ms. DeVost went to a concert and his social media detective work began. What follows is a fiery exchange of text messages, revealed in court like a dramatic reading at an award show, where Ms. DeVost coldly denies Mr. Walker's paternity. She went out of town to a concert, and when she came back, a friend of hers inboxed me saying that I wasn't his his father. So her own friends were coming and telling you, hey, this isn't your child. Yes, friends, family members, my family members. Take me to the moment where you found out from Miss DeVos that you may not be Kamani's biological father. When did she finally tell you that? It was probably maybe around June. It was May. Around one of those times. Just when you think it can't get more intense, Judge Lake steps in like a superhero to set things straight. She calls out Miss DeVos for her cavalier attitude and lack of accountability, laying down a verbal smackdown 
that's as scorching as a hot sauce tasting contest. The judge emphasizes the emotional toll of the whole saga on Mr. Walker and little Kaimani. You sitting up here acting like Satan's sidekick in here talking about you ruined your own life. I didn't have nothing about it. Nobody told you to stay. What's going on? Cause see, I'm not gonna let you go back too far from center. Now you can come in here and tell the truth and say you made a mistake and you did something for your benefit and you were scared and you didn't want to be by yourself. But what you're not gonna do is sit up here and convince me, oh, he, he, he could have left. Why? Grab your tissues, folks, because the DNA test results are in and they're as dramatic as a season finale cliffhanger. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Walker, you are not the father. I'm sorry. The courtroom kicks off with a bang as the judge makes her entrance, and Jerome rolls out the welcome mat for the legal showdown of Richardson versus Robbins. The stage is set for a legal tangle that promises more twists than a pretzel factory. This is a case of Richardson versus Robbins. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Mr. Richardson, you claim you made a huge mistake. I mean, you signed the birth certificate of the defendant's two-month-old son, DeMarlin, even though you doubt you are his father. You want to prove your case before you end up paying child support for a baby you know isn't yours. Miss Robbins fires back with unshakable confidence, claiming Mr. Richardson's only real mistake is denying their son, whom she firmly believes will be proven by DNA to be his. The courtroom air is thick with anticipation as she stands her ground, ready for the genetic showdown. The plaintiff's only mistake is denying your son because you claim the DNA will prove that he is DeMarlin's father. Mr. Richardson, why'd you sign the birth certificate if you doubt it? I just, it was at the moment and I felt that, I don't know, it may be mine. Why would Mr. Richardson sign on the dotted line Line if he had doubts. He spills that in the heat of the moment, amidst the delivery room drama, he thought the baby might be his. But whoops, maybe not. The plot thickens and the stakes get higher as the judge dives deeper. He was there during the whole entire time, during delivery and birth, or pregnancy. He was there. And did you try to guilt twice. him into it? Did you guys have a nope. conversation? Did he express to you any reservation that nope. he really didn't want to sign this birth nope. certificate? I asked him, are you sure you want to do this? The audience gasps as Mr. Richardson discusses the baby's surprisingly light complexion, suggesting he looked like a Mexican or something. The courtroom buzzes with whispers and raised eyebrows as he navigates this sensitive topic with the grace of a bull in a china shop. But does that... But he was so... When I saw the baby, he was so white. He was so... He looked like a Mexican or something. A Mexican? Come on yeah, now, light -skinned. Light -skinned. I'm Yes, you are. You're very light-skinned. But listen, but... listen, listen. That doesn't matter. Come in all shapes and sizes and he just spent nine months or more in the womb. That's true. The tale takes a twist as Mr. Richardson reveals his backstory with Miss Robin including his initial role as her side piece while she was still married. The courtroom's collective jaw drops as the drama escalates with this juicy tidbit. When I was dating her, it's very sneaky. Hmm. So are you. How, Mr. Richardson? She was sneaky from the start when I met her, Yana. I met her at a club, came, approached her, didn't think she was gonna give me the time of day or nothing. So he but, pursued me. Yeah, yep. no, you're right about that. I yep. did pursue you. I, For a long I, time. I pursued after her. I got out there. Yep. And we got to talking, and then she told me, she said, I'm married. And <laughs> when she said the word but, that means I'm willing to maybe see you or something, uh, play around with you. So, Miss Robbins recounts the festive backdrop of their baby making, a new couch, a new apartment, and a Christmas celebration that apparently included more than just eggnog. The story paints a picture of a couple who mixed holiday cheer with some serious relationship milestones. That I was divorced, especially if it was just me and him for the we last three the years. I was... That was at first. No, and but you know when that. you showed me that paper, it was on the internet, I looked it and up. And he said I... that anybody can be on anybody the internet, can but I showed him the declarations. He just doesn't believe anything. You had to go on the internet to show him? You didn't have a physical copy. I didn't have a physical copy, but mm. I know that you can get it on the... You didn't have a physical copy of your own divorce decree? No, I didn't. The judge presses for details about the fateful night that led to baby DeMarlin's conception, set against a Christmassy backdrop with a brand new couch in the mix. Laughter ensues as the court imagines the scene, and the details get as tangled as Christmas lights. Do you remember the I night? I remember the night. Okay, tell the court what happened. So the night we, um, it was during Christmas, and we had just bought a couch, and I just moved into my place, and <laughs> within that that week time, like me and Mr. Richardson basically gave our house a blessing or my house a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Richardson expresses his ongoing doubts, particularly bothered by being left out of prenatal appointments, a move he interprets as suspiciously exclusive. The courtroom leans in as he lays out his suspicions, wondering if there's more to the story than Miss Robbins lets on. God, there's a million, but I'm gonna try to narrow down at least one or two. I went to one doctor's appointment with her, right? I want to go to the other one. She told me, no, you don't have to come. I don't I need said, you to Why? hold my hand. I don't need you to hold my hand. That's, what? That's, oh, that's what he's you... not mine. This is not my baby. All this do the exactly. whole time. So why would I let you be a part of that? As the plot thickens, 
Robbins, Mr. Richardson brings up a botched attempt to confirm paternity via DNA test, accusing Miss Robbins of ducking out at the last minute. The tension builds as the courtroom waits for her rebuttal, wondering if she'll clear the air or add more smoke. She made an appointment. We supposed to split 135, it was two something, to go get a DNA test. She said, I set an appointment. I'm gonna come, come at 4.30 when you get off work. I got there but at 3 But I made the appointment. Yes, you made the appointment. The, but you said it was 4.30. I got at your house at 3 o'clock. 3.30, calm. We sitting around, okay. Appointment's at 4.30. 4 o'clock, calm. We sitting around. 4.15, we sitting around. I'm but like, I'm what's up? Who made the Are we going to get this? And I That's asked her. But about. did you go to the appointment? No, Your Honor. The judge, not one to mince words, lays out the case's complexities with the precision of a chef slicing onions, bringing tears to some eyes, no doubt. She notes the swirling doubts and missed opportunities to settle the paternity mystery, setting the stage for a reveal that promises to be as explosive as a fireworks finale. Whether he's right or wrong, only the DNA is gonna be able... He feels like what you say has no credibility. Because when you met him, you not married. Then you was married. Then you gotta get your divorce to go online. You don't have a physical copy of it. I mean, the stories just keep coming and coming and coming. You have the opportunity to resolve and shut him uh, up. Put a zip on And my... Lord knows... Oh, my... <laughs> we need that to happen. <laughs> Drum roll, please. The DNA results are in, and Mr. Richardson. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Richardson, you are father. Just another day in court, folks. The case of Burridge versus Stephanie's kicks off with courtroom clerk Ron setting the stage. Mr. Burridge has dragged Ms. Stephanie's to court, loaded with claims about paternity doubts and hefty financial demands. Judge Lake takes the helm, ready to navigate through this stormy legal drama. Let's buckle up for a wild ride. This is case of Barrage v. Stephens. Thank you, Ron. Good day, everyone. Mr. Barrage, you've dragged Ms. Stephens to court because you say you're being played for a fool. And when today's DNA results prove that you are not her daughter, Phelan's father, you demand that your name be removed from her birth certificate and you be reimbursed for the past eight months of child care expenses. So here's the scoop. Mr. Burridge is up first and he's not mincing words. He claims he's been played for a fool, firmly believing he is not the father of Ms. Stephanie's daughter, Phelan. He's asking for a legal out from the birth certificate and wants his money back for all those diapers and baby formula. Ms. Stephanie's counters with her own frustrations, tired of Mr. Burridge's public accusations and embarrassed in front of family and friends. Oh, the drama is just just getting started. You say you're tired of Mr. Barrage calling you out and embarrassing you in front of your family by claiming that your child belongs to another man. So, Mr. Barrage, tell me why you feel like a fool. I feel like a fool, Your Honor, because I signed the birth certificate of a child that's not mine. Just when you thought it couldn't get any spicier, Ms. Kirstephanie Stephanie's takes the stand to defend her honor, tired of being called out by Mr. Burridge. The plot thickens as both admit to having side pieces during their relationship, which only adds fuel to the fiery debate of who fathered whom. The tension's building, and trust me, you don't want to miss what comes next. But you don't believe you're the biological father. You signed the birth certificate. You was there with me through the whole pregnancy, taking me to doctor's appointments, watching the kid. You've been there but playing a role had in a, her life. I also had another woman on the side, and you had another guy on the side. What girlfriend? I never knew it was a girlfriend. We were together every day since the first day we started hanging out. Can you believe this? The judge tries to untangle their complicated relationship status, which Mr. Burridge initially dismisses as just a casual fling. Ms. Stephanie's isn't having any of it, insisting they were practically joined at the hip, way more than just a simple fling. This soap opera unfolds further, and oh boy, the next revelation is a doozy. What kind of relationship were you all in now? It's supposed to be in the one you night stand, You said something to do. Something to do, like a, you know, just a, a fling. Okay, it started off as just a casual fling. Yes. Do you remember the day she told you she was pregnant? Yes. I sent them a text, text message of the pregnancy test. I told him, I'm pregnant. He said, oh, I'm going to be there. I, that's my child. I'm going to be in his or her life. He's saying that I was just something to do, but that was never my impression. Me and Fernando, we was together all the time. Plot twist incoming. Mr. Burridge throws a curveball with his exhibit, a baby photo no less. He points out that the baby's eye and skin color don't match his, hinting that Mr. Light Eyes might be the real daddy. The court is buzzing with whispers and side eyes. Grab your popcorn because this courtroom drama is about to hit peak melodrama. I, can I show you? I have a uh... Oh, you have an exhibit? Yes, yes, Please, Your Honor. the other guy. For one, Your Honor, I don't have light blue, green, haze wise, Your Honor. That's for one. The other guy has light eyes. Yes, Your Honor. And for one, Your Honor, I'm, Me and my I'm brown skinny, Your Honor. Light brown I, eyes. I, 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 hey, the guy got light skinny complexion, Your Honor. 
So these are all the factors you believe that add up. Ye You're not yes Phelan's father. Yes, Your Honor. Things are heating up. The discussion veers to another man who boldly claimed paternity at a party. The gossip mill is in full swing, with neighbors and random passersby adding their two cents, complicating Mr. Burridge's doubts even further. This paternity puzzle is getting juicier by the minute. Stick around, the emotional roller coaster is just climbing. I really don't know who my father is, because my name ain't on the birth certificate other than what my mother tell me, but ain't no name on the birth certificate. My generation, I can go back on my generation, my families are closing that family all the way to like 1874. And like far as our genetic code, everybody, like, we, we got like big nose, big lips. You know, that baby got light eyes, little nose, little Thailand I know the baby. is not only from you, Mr. Barrage, you can have my genes. Well, the baby don't look nothing like you. Emotions on the edge. Mr. Burridge opens up about his deep-seated fears of the child growing up fatherless. Just like he did, his poignant confession shows a softer side amid the courtroom chaos, tugging at everyone's heartstrings. The stakes are high, and you'll definitely want to see how this emotional saga unfolds. I, you I said don't do it. I didn't, I didn't do want it. your child to grow up a bastard like me. But you said you know? don't do it, though. But you're... Where, I'm a where? You know, a man. You know what I'm saying? And, and, but I felt like yeah. if you had any doubt... So Barack, that hurt you, because I can see that that hurt you, the possibility Possibility that this child will come into the world and live out the experiences you live. Yes, Sean. Here comes the moment of truth. The DNA results are in, and guess what? It has been determined by this court. Mr. Barrage, you are her father. Thank you, Sean. The courtroom buzzes with anticipation as everyone settles in. The court session kicks off with introductions, and the juicy case of Garrett versus Boyer is announced. Ms. Garrett strides in with a mission to prove that Mr. Boyer is the biological father of her adorable two-year-old daughter, Naomi. The stage is set for some courtroom drama, and you can cut the tension with a knife. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is the case of Garrett versus Boyer. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. Garrett, you are here on a mission today to prove that the defendant, Mr. Boyer, is the biological father of your two-year-old daughter. Or Naomi, is that yes, correct? Your Honor. Buckle up for a roller coaster of courtroom banter. Ms. Garrett lays it all on the table, asserting that after a month of nonstop, unprotected romantic escapades with Mr. Boyer, she is beyond convinced he is Naomi's dad. Mr. Boyer counters, totally flabbergasted, claiming he only got wind of Naomi's existence a mere two months ago. Strap in, because the plot is about to thicken. That after a month of nonstop, unprotected sex with the defendant, you are 100% sure that he fathered your child. Mr. Boyer, you say there's no no way that you could be the biological father of Miss Garrett's baby. Her child is two years old, and you just learned of Naomi two months ago. Here comes the backstory, and it's spicy. We dive into the details of Miss Garrett and Mr. Boyer's relationship. It turns out they weren't exactly picking out China patterns. Nope, they were just friends with some serious benefits. They clarify that they were not in a committed relationship, but enjoyed a brief, steamy spree of frequent, unprotected sex. And just when you think it's all out in the open, there's more juice to squeeze. We were friends. Um, I met Mr. Boyer back in two. December of 2014, you know, right away. We, we made an instant connection, Your Honor. This sex was, I mean, like, we exchanged numbers. We had inconsistent sex, which was amazing. I'm not gonna sit here and fall to nobody. And, and we had 31 yeah, days of sex unprotected and... Did I hear you say you had 31 days straight of yes. unprotected yes. sex? <laughs> and the plot twists like a pretzel. Ms. Garrett drops another bombshell. She initially thought another gentleman was Naomi's father due to her following relationship. This fellow was all in, thinking he was the dad until a paternity test flipped the script. Hold on to your hats because this emotional roller coaster isn't slowing down. When you find out you're pregnant, who do you tell? Your Honor, after our sexual relationship was over, I, con I wound up dating another guy. Me and Hunts was consistent then. You started dating. dating somebody new and you thought it was his child. So you told him, I'm pregnant. Pregnant. Yes. So you told him you were pregnant and you never thought to notify Mr. Boyer? Mr. Boyer, no were you ever notified she was pregnant at all or did you find out? No, I, don't, I wasn't notified at all. Don't blink now. The truth starts unraveling at breakneck speed. After the paternity test sidelines the initial candidate, Ms. Garrett reaches out to Mr. Boyer, hinting that he might just be Naomi's real daddy. This revelation cranks up the tension and uncertainty between them to 11. You won't believe what comes out next. Mr. Boyer, you're saying you didn't hear about Naomi again until just two months ago? Yes. She inboxed me on Facebook, same place she blocked me at. Told me like, oh, well, you know, um, the other boy, the, the, the test came back that he's not the dad, so you gotta be the dad. So I was like, that is not I, how I, I immediately had a flashback own. from Talladega Nights. If you thought it couldn't get wilder, think again. Mr. Boyer shares his heartfelt doubts about being the father, noting that he feels zero spiritual connection with Naomi and doesn't see any family resemblance. As the suspense builds towards the DNA result reveal, everyone's on the edge of their seats. Mr. Boyer, you are not the father. <gasps>